Our Doris by Charles Heathcote. One, slugs. Our Doris has developed an unhealthy obsession with slugs. She's in the garden from breakfast until the one show, finding the beggars and pouring salt on them. She likes to watch them die, keeps her eyes peeled as they shrink, curling in on themselves until they resemble, well, dead slugs really. I never was one for similes. A dead slug is a dead slug in my book and you can beg her off trying to tell me otherwise. She did try using beer for a while, until I discovered where all of my Guinness were going. I wouldn't mind if our Doris had a drinking problem. She might be less keen to donate me socks to Sue Ryder. But I do mind when she's using my well-earned ale to pickle slugs. You should see her on a morning. She'll come into the lounge with a cup of tea in one hand and a bucket of pallets in the other. I say to her, I say, what are you doing with that bucket, our Doris? And she gives me the look. All squinted eyes and pursed lips. What do you think I'm doing, Harold? Holding a flaming seance? I'm going to murder the beggars, she says. She's got a new smile. Enjoys herself more than she ever did at the co-op. Not that she didn't have fun there. If someone let her loose with a pricing gun, she'd add 20% to the potted beef and reduce the whiskey. She's always had a thing for famous grouse. Says it reminds her of her mother. I say it'd be hard not to, considering our Doris's mother drank that much grouse, it were a wonder she could leave the house on the glorious twelfth. Either way, it got back to our Doris's manager, as she were out on her ear. Someone had complained, apparently. Something about how their brother-in-law had spent his life savings on whiskey, was back three steps on his Alcoholics Anonymous programme, and currently inhabited her airing cupboard, which she wouldn't mind had she not just purchased several inexpensive items from Laura Ashley, and he'd use them as hand towels when they were guest towels. Not that our Doris minded. She always thought the co-op were beneath her. I remember when she first got the job. She was 16 and full of exuberance, excitement and the wherewithal to throw pink ladies at any man whose hands found themselves creeping too close towards her Granny Smiths. Then she found out that Janice Dooley of Little Street had found a job at Gadsden and Taylor as an office girl for Mr Gadsden himself and she became completely and utterly incensed. I was certain that our Doris were going to develop a twitch. Of course, we weren't together then, but as someone who frequented the co-op to observe a certain shop girl's pink ladies, I'm quite positive it was nothing short of a twitch. Our Doris were like a woman possessed. Within the first week of her discovery, she had spread the rumour that Janice and Mr Gadsden were having at it in the storage cupboard. It didn't matter that Mr Gadsden were 47 and couldn't see his feet for his belly. It doesn't take much for folk to look at you differently. Everyone fancies spreading rumours about you. It takes away from the drudgery that is common life. I mean, it was easy enough to imagine, because it was difficult for Janice to rub two pennies together, and most had it in their heads already that her father had brought the way in. A fortnight later, and pictures emerged in the Gazette of Janice and Mr Gadsden leaving the factory at the same time. Within the month, Janice had been given leave from the factory to visit long-lost relatives in Canberra, and Mr Gadsden had her job advertised in the post office window. This coincided with our Doris's release from the cop, and she got the job. When Janice Dooley returned, she tried to spread the rumour that our Doris had spread lies, but no one could believe that of a shop girl who reduced whiskey so as their grandparents could get rid of ailments from the common cold to laryngitis. I know our Doris won't give up until she's committed slug genocide, until our back garden is awash with their corpses. She came in this morning in what she calls her Felicity Kendall. I said to her, I said, what are you wearing that for, R. Doris? You're going to get yourself filthy anyway. The look came with the side of hands on hips, pressing in the baggy sides of her dungarees. She said to me, she said, One must present themselves at their best at all times, R. Old. If you haven't figured that out in 54 years, I don't know what you've been doing. Besides, if those slugs know what's good for them, they'll know that the second I see a spot of mud on my blouse, I'll boil them in a pot whilst their heart's still beating and take escargot to the next bring them by. I think it's one too many repeats of the good life on gold, but have kept me mouth shut. No point begging to be lambasted about why she had to spend £20 on gloves when I have a perfectly good pair in the shed. She's in the price tax of a dungaree, so I'll thank the Lord for small mercies. Three weeks ago, our Doris stormed into the front room, tore off her gloves finger by finger and threw them at my feet. 
She paced back and forth, back and forth across the bleeding carpet, almost pierced the floors with her high heels. And she doesn't just speak the information like any reasonable wife might do to her unsuspecting husband of half a century. No. She throws herself in both barrels, yelling, bleeding, X, she yelled. Can you believe it? I mean, can you believe it, Harold? The cheek of it, the bloody small-minded cheek of violet bleeding grey. I were going to respond, but my lips had barely parted when she inhaled and her mouth kept on running. She knows I've wanted to be part of the garden safari for how long now, and this year she conveniently misplaces my entry. Misplaces, she said. She's never managed to misplace a bloody husband, even after he made advances towards Henrietta Wicks during the blackout of August 1972. She burst towards the window and peered down the road, the tip of her nose pressed against the glass, eyes darting side to side. I felt sure she were going to tear down the curtains and use them as a noose. I said to her, I said, So are you in the safari or not, are Doris? Her eyes stopped being part of her face at that point. She glared at me and said, she said, Oh, I'm part of the competition, Arald. Do you know what she said to me? She came over all glum, and she knows I can't say anything because she sat between Mrs Cribbins and Mrs Patel, and she knows all about how I'm planning on inviting them to me next garden's party, and they sure as my name is Doris will not RSVP if they see me point the finger at Violet Doe-Eyed Grey. I lost my thread here. Only five minutes before I'd been sat proudly reading the Daily Mirror, when in she came and blew my train of thought to smithereens. So I put my paper down. And I said to her, I said, if you're part of the competition, what's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? Do you want to know what the problem is, R. Harold? With a first house, house number one. No one will pay any attention whatsoever to the flowers. They'll definitely not ask me about what compost I use. I didn't have the heart to point out that I'm the one who gardens and she's the one who sits in the deck chair sipping cups of tea from Wittard's best china cups. It wouldn't have mattered any which way because she kept harping on about her dress and how she'd seen just the one she wanted in Debenhams that screamed decorum with the added bonus of being high street so she needn't worry about anyone thinking she thought she was above them and too hoity-toity. And that's when she mentioned them. She said... And have you seen the garden recently? It's practically riddled with slugs. Slugs. Most people put down pallets, but no. What does my husband do? He bloody farms and... Tell me, R. Harold, does something I say convince you that the best recourse would be to fill my garden with gelatinous pests? Give me a swarm of locusts any day. After that, I've had to bear three weeks of R. Doris the serial killer. If David Attenborough ever turned up in our garden wanting to film a feature on the common garden slug, the most he'd find would be an older lady picking up the inebriated beggars with a trowel and dropping them into a bucket. She went one step further that morning. After presenting herself as Cheshire's answer to Felicity Kendall, looking more like a burnt sausage in denim, R. Doris sat down in the chair beside me. Now R. Doris only sits in this chair when she wants to talk to me, Otherwise, she's in the office writing letters. Or in the high-backed Victorian armchair she spent £500 on because it gave off just the right air of class without being pretentious. I knew it were important, so I turned off the television. Something I don't do meekly. Our cat once dug up her at number 42's daffodils, and I didn't stop him until I saw Richard Illman drive Gail into the canal. Our Doris smiled. Something else that doesn't happen often. And said to me, she said, Ah, Harold. She stretched it out so it sounded something like a cat mid meow. You know, you always go down to the allotment on Wednesdays. I said to her, I said, of course I know, R. Doris. It's the only day you let me go free. But if I had my choice, I'd be down there from noon till night. But I get me three days out of the week. Monday, Wednesday and Friday. All the days where R. Doris is either otherwise engaged or wants me out from under her feet. Well, she said to me, all fluttering eyelashes and puckered lips, would you like to maybe take me? I'd love to see what you've done with the place. And besides, she licked her lips at this one. She knew she had me. It's a move wives have perfected over the years, she said. I don't think we spend enough time together. I said to her, what do you mean we don't spend enough time together? We bleed and live together. The damage had been done. Our Doris reigned supreme once again and I had to figure out how to break it to the lads. When I first got the allotment, 
our Doris came down to complete an inspection. Didn't want her husband giving folk the impression she didn't have enough for him to do at home. Then she discovered that Edith let Alf go down to get him out of her air, and if Edith Simpson's already doing it, our Doris needs to be at least two steps ahead. Our Doris didn't make the best first impression. She put a deck chair in the middle of Fred's vegetable patch, which didn't go down well with the lads because his wife had just left him for an Audi saleswoman from Tunbridge Wells. She picked a prize marrow from Peter's plot and said she'd grown it herself. The allotment ended up being declared a no Doris zone. Which is how I found myself at the Hare and Horse, drinking half a bit of shandy with Alf, who'd fa already found his way through a pint and a half. We were in a state of bliss. He'd had a win on the horses and managed to get out of Tesco without security notice and he'd made away with a six-pack of Melton Mowbray and a bag of peanuts. His Edith wouldn't be happy. But usually he's disposed of the evidence by the time he gets home. Says he goes to visit their grandson at the charity shop, when in reality he's making off with the beggars from the old folks home in the hope of a free meal and a lift home. So, he said to me, armed with another pint, your Doris is ready to visit and you've not told her she isn't allowed. I put my wallet back in my pocket and nodded. I said to him, I said, I've never had the art to tell her. We might not get on sometimes, but I'm not Genghis Khan. Alf laughed at this. Mouth so wide you could see bits of pork pie on his tongue. He said, no, but your Doris will be when she finds out what you've been hiding. Don't I know it, I said. Remember when your Edith had a new bathroom and I hadn't told her why you had to keep bobbing around ours for showers? I thought she were going to rip me face off and use it as toilet paper. And before I knew it, we were at B&Q testing the finishes on bathtubs and our Doris was using the checkbook that much the pages could have set a light and she wouldn't have noticed until the firemen were flinging her over his shoulder. So you want me to sweeten up the lads down the allotment? Alf whistled between his teeth and rubbed his hands together. This is going to cost you something, our old, old chap. You think two pints is going to cover it? Oh, no. I'll have to tell the big boss man, and you know what that means? He won't settle for less than a sausage dinner with extra pickled onions. I said to him, I said, she's just one woman. Alf looked at me in a way I've only seen when he was slapped around the face by a trout and whistled again. She's never been just a woman, Harold. She's Doris. I couldn't sleep that night. I'd broken the news to our Doris that she'd have to wait until the Friday because they had a big project on. In actual fact, I needed to give the lads time to acclimatise to the idea of Cheshire's very own Margaret Thatcher visiting their patch. Our Doris slept soundly. She'd had a good day in the garden and managed to slaughter seven slugs. I have a worry she'll leave them in her at number 42's garden. It's not that she doesn't like her. It's just that she sees their garden as an unkempt display of everything that is wrong with British society. She's not been happy since the council bought some of the houses on our street and let them out to people she deems part of the underclass she wants no part of. When her at number 42 moved in, our Doris said she said, Look at her. You should always give off the best first impression. And what's my impression of her? She's too lazy to iron a blouse. Things have got worse ever since. They nearly came to a head once, but our Doris refuses to reduce herself to such debauchery as parading insults in the middle of the street she has lived in her entire married life. I'd have liked to have told her that it wasn't her at number 42 who kept me awake at night, worried that my blood pressure would get that high I'd end up boiling to death. Sometimes I wonder whether I'd be better wearing a pulse monitor. I'd like to have some proper warning, rather than having to gauge our Doris's expression to see whether or not I'll end up dead by Granada reports. Another thing that kept me awake was the dulcet tones of our Doris's snoring. There's this certain quality to it that stops you from sleeping. Imagine yourself in Africa. You're there, trying to sleep at night, when an elephant with a sinus infection decides to come and sneeze in your ear. At breakfast the next morning, our Doris threw back her muesli whilst I found it difficult to get bread from the bread bin to the toaster. I had this silent hope that she'd forgotten all about the allotment that it had been some whim, some rush of the menopause left dormant due to excessive use of HRT. She sat there, spoon in one hand, copying the Daily Mail in the other, reading all about how eating too much celery can lead to cancer. There's no issue for me there, then. I've not been able to chew celery since I got me dentures, no matter the amount of fixed and to put on them. I approached the toaster all quiet-like, hoping that for once it had remained silent when I popped me bread in. No such luck. Our oh, Doris's head up, flew up and she were glaring at me. 
I'd rather have taken me chances with the devil himself. She said to me, she said, I'm going out today to buy my outfit for this Friday, Arnold. How do you think I should play it? I said to her, I said, you could play it however you're bleeding like and the lads won't notice. The focus, star Doris, like to keep to the task at hand. But they know I'm coming, she said. I thought my own eyes would pop out my head. Then I said, of course they know you're coming. You think I'd let you down the allotment without telling someone? That'd be like sending a juggernaut into a cul-de-sac, that would our Doris. She didn't know what to say to that. It's one of the good things about being married to our Doris. She doesn't tend to notice much when she's got her mind on something. The nine months when she were pregnant were absolute bliss. I can tell you. I had free reign to do what I like. I could eat chips every day. I could ride my bicycle for more than work purposes. In the end, I came off my bike on a country road in rain and went ended up with a broken arm. Our Doris weren't too happy. The bike were her only chance at showing off she cared about the environment. My toast popped up and I set about buttering it. Our Doris had her beady eyes on me, so I said to her, I said, What's so bad about being the first house, our Doris? Her shoulders bunched. Her eyes pinched shut and she said to me, she said, there are ten gardens in total, our old. The first four houses don't get noticed. Folks speed through them certain they're not missing anything. If you're the fifth house, people pay attention. They realise they've gone too fast and now they're at the halfway point and all they've got at home is a washing up bowl full of dishes and a Catherine Cookson that isn't living up to much. For the last seven years, Violet Grey has been house number five. I can have a number five garden, Arnold. I didn't marry you for a number one garden. I said to her, I said, What did you marry me for then? It weren't your brains, I can tell you, she said. Why not make a garden that good people have to stop? She said to me, I could have a naked Susan Boyle singing the aria from Tosca and people wouldn't notice until they're eating the Christmas shortbread. It's June. Exactly. What are you going to do? Violet's already allocated the gardens, I said. She pursed her lips at this, shoulders back and said to me, she said, I have arranged for the committee to come and view the garden next week. I am making an appeal. I didn't know what to say, so I had a bite of me toast. I don't know what you're supposed to say to your wife of half a century when she treats a garden safari as seriously as the parliamentary election. As soon as I could, I made a break for it. For the second day in a row, I met Alf at the Hare and Horse to discuss strategies for the royal visit. He looked a bit shifty when I got there, something I hadn't seen since that time he bought 17 cans of Caribbean sunset paint from Little Sid before finding out he couldn't flog them because they caused allergic reactions and left 12 goslings with breeding difficulties. I said to him, I said, what have you done now, Alf? Well, if he didn't look like someone had stolen his favourite yo-yo, I don't know what he looked like. He said to me, he said, Edie were wondering where I'd been all afternoon. I told her. I said right to a face that had been down the allotment. And, I said, now she wants to visit. She's working out the dates as we speak. Something about keeping an eye on the men folk without snooping. She doesn't want your Doris to get ahead of her. But everything went down well with the big boss. Oh, why, he said. When I said it were for the garden safari, you're more than happy to. He's only gone and got himself seventh house, hasn't he? I gulped then and said to him, I said, I best get the pints in. He said, you only drink halves. I said, wait until our Doris finds out the news. I need all the Dutch courage I can get. On the Friday, I thought my head were going to explode. Our Doris hadn't reacted well to the news that the big boss had been placed at house number seven when she'd been relegated to first. She said to me, she said, how could you let this happen, our Harold? After everything I have told you, the seventh house is halfway between the fifth and the tenth house. After this house, they start flagging. This is the least pretentious of all houses. I bet he's having it off with Violet. I wouldn't be surprised. She doesn't care where men have been as long as they have a pulse and full control of their own bladder. She didn't talk to me on Friday morning except to ask me about her outfit. I think my jaw dropped. My dentures couldn't have fallen out and I wouldn't have noticed until I couldn't tell me gums from me tongue. Our Doris were wearing jeans. Jeans! 
When jeans first came to our town, she refused to wear them. She's opposed denim for that long when she brought dungarees. I thought she were in the midst of a stroke. And yet there she stood in front of me in jeans and a blouse that I call purple, but our Doris dubbed lilac. I said to her, I said, you look like a gardener, our Doris. She let me have a smile and we were in the car and on our way before I had a chance to finish me brew. It takes five minutes to get from our house to the allotment. I opened the door for our Doris and she rose from the course as slow and Dracula-like. I said to her, what do you think, our Doris? She didn't reply. Instead, she headed straight for the gate and flung it open. I have never seen the men look so worried. A tank could have come through and crushed their plots and they couldn't have been more terrified. Ben caught her gaze almost immediately. I saw the smile plant itself on her lips, the one that says she's found her prey. You're just waiting for the fangs to come and tear out your jugular. Without stopping to let me through the gate, she tore forward and planted herself in front of Ben's plot. They're not big. Only enough space for a shed and a few rows of vegetables. But at that moment, every man in the place looked like he wished there weren't so much space. Ben's mouth didn't know what to do with itself. He made some circles, stammered some words, gulped before settling for, I'll do, Doris. Ah, Doris beamed and said to him, she said, Hello, Ben. You do look well. And how's Elaine? He wiped his brow and took a breath that large. I think he soaked up half the oxygen. She's all right, thanks, he said. Folk will try that with our Doris, keep to the minimal reply, hoping it'll move her along. It didn't, she said. Good. And what are you doing with yourself today? She glanced at his plot and unlatched the gate, stepping in. It appears you've been weeding. They're such pests, aren't they? With that, she marched towards Ben's shed and grabbed a vat of Roundup and opened it. Ben rushed across, eyes wide, stammering. He said, actually, Doris, I'll plant him. But it were too late. Our Doris rushed up and down the plot like a woman possessed. She hadn't been pouring long when Ben stopped her. His face were no more pink than beetroot. He said to her, he said, What do you think you're doing? You come here. I know we're doing Harold a favour by letting you come here, but pouring weed killer all over a man's fresh seeds. It beggars belief. Our Doris flashed a look in my direction. She nodded and placed a hand on Ben's arm. It's quite all right. You haven't yet gained the expertise necessary to determine whether or not your plot needs a good pruning. Ask our Harold if you can borrow his fork. I'm absolutely positive that he'll have something suitable in his workroom. With that, our Doris left the plot and by way of farewell added, Do tell Elaine I asked after her. It's been so long since last we met that I'm sure that there are a great many topics to catch up on. As our Doris moved ahead, I made our way to Ben's plot. What's the damage? He looked at his freshly sewn plot and shook his head. I don't know, Harold. At least I stopped her before she did anything too bad. Why did she want to come down here anyway? Last I heard, she'd given up on gardening in favour of the theatre. I said to him, I said, she did. But then that violet grey came up with the garden safari, didn't she? And haven't I known it every blithering year since? Before we could continue, there were an almighty scream. I thought someone must have stepped on a cat's tail. There was a belated air raid. An ambulance had run over a whoopee cushion. I did not expect to see our Doris with her foot in the middle of Peter's prize marrow. Only Peter weren't screaming. I wasn't even sure he was living. He'd collapsed on the ground. The colour drained completely from his face. No, it were our Doris wailing like a banshee. Harold, she screamed, look what this great blithering vegetable's done to my new plimsolls. She pulled her leg free so that I could see her leg covered in a green gunk. She caught sight of Peter and I've never seen her fly into more of a rage. And then the beggar thinks it's the best time to have bloody sleep. Never in my life have I seen such laziness. His father fought for this country and he thinks he can get away with ruining my m and plimsolls by lying down amongst the vegetables. I will send him my dry cleaning bill. I will inform his wife. After checking Peter had, had some form of cardiac arrest and took our Doris home. Our Doris didn't find any new ways to commit slug slaughter. She strengthened her efforts to pour salt on them. If you'd gone into the garden that week, you'd have been sure that we'd let it out to an alcoholic with a waste disposal problem. I'd only have to walk down to my shed to find half-cut slugs dwindling to an untimely death. 
she stopped eating her meals and using antibacterial gel every time she touched a trowel. Her hair became matted. She didn't put on makeup. From dawn till dusk, our Doris lingered in the garden, ridding it of pests, planting flowers and hiding unsightly mounds of dirt with pebbles from focus. When she were finished, she showed it to me and said, she said, what do you think, R. Harold? I said, it's fantastic, R. Doris. And I weren't lying. The garden were wonderful. It looked as though someone had taken a small patch of land and replaced it with an art installation. It made me want to use similes. There were small, delicate flowers and large, blooming ones. Purples and pinks and blues and yellows and reds. The garden were the perfect embodiment of our Doris. I said to her, I said, you'll be fifth house before you know it. I should have kept my mouth shut. Wish I'd kept my bleeding mouth shut, because what went and happened that night? A storm, in the middle of June, as though the forces of nature thought they could come along and put our Doris's work to shame. Violet showed up in the morning with the committee. She's one of those women who hold their noses that high, you're surprised they don't tip over backwards. She said to our Doris, she said, Good morning, Doris. Such terrible weather we had last night. I hope your garden was saved. Our Doris bit her tongue and said, she said, Oh, well, you see, Violet, there was a slight issue. The wind's torn my flowers to shreds and the stems have broken. The stones have all sunk in, but there's still an abundance of something I'm sure you'll find familiar. You're both so alike after all. Our Doris showed Violet to the garden, her head held high. She flung open the door, a grin on her face, and said to her, she said, Slugs, now you mustn't be downhearted, Violet. I've always found you both to be delightfully slimy.